Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite show about cognition, creativity, and this week I got 99 problems, and problem solving is definitely the worst of them. I've got 99 luft balloons. So I start with a modern day hip hop reference, and you go to an 80s Cold War epic? <laughs> Nena. <laughs> That's kind of par for the course, actually. Um, I love that Captain Kirk is the only thing that is Captain Kirk in both versions in of the, that song. In the German version, still yeah. in English, yeah. Like, they don't translate it at all. Like, she's just rattling off in German, and then suddenly you hear, hey, Captain Kirk, it's great. It's a proper noun at that point. Well, but Captain, there's got to be, there's got to be <laughs> a German. I mean. The whole thing is the proper noun. <laughs> That's true, because, so I mean, if I'm watching the, if I'm watching original series or any, any of them in German translation, do they not translate ranks? I don't know. I mean, maybe for everyone else, but not Captain for Kirk. him. And I bet I bet they call him Mr. Spock, not like Senior Spock. Okay, first off, it would be Herr Spock, <laughs> not Senior in Germany. <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping around. I, <laughs> I'm saying this is universal. Okay, um, that's fair though. I, you're right. I bet Mr. Spock. Uh, do you watch Young Sheldon at all? Probably not. I do not. There's there's an episode where the mom keeps calling it Dr. Spock, and Sheldon's like, it's Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock's a Vulcan. Dr. Spock writes books about babies. Like, and I just, I remember thinking that's pretty funny. Okay, so today we're talking about uh, problem solving and how we, as a society, I can't speak to other education systems of, of either Western or Eastern cultures, because I don't know about any of those. But I, I can say that in Western culture, we are almost fundamentally not taught how to solve problems. And that is a problem in general. Too bad we have no way to solve that. <laughs> we, no, it really is. And I think that COVID and the current election is a, a really good back... Uh, you know, by the time this is aired, hopefully we'll know who the president is, but at current, we don't. Yeah, this is coming out two weeks from now, so I'd say odds are poor. <laughs> odds are poor that we will know who the president is in two weeks, frankly. Like, but but maybe, hey, future us, do you know who the president is? Because send word, we don't. Um, no, it's from the very, very young age, starting in kindergarten, well, that's not fair, you know, that, that's the very base level, but it, we never break from it. All the way through college, we teach someone what a problem is, and then we teach them the steps to solve it. We never teach them to identify the problem. No one ever gave me a, a geometric question and asked me, how, sh how would you figure out the length of the ladder you need to get onto that roof? And let me think through what the, the well, if it's a 10 foot high roof and I'm 10 feet away, no one ever, proposed that problem to me. They gave me word problems that proposed that problem kind of later after they'd set me through it. But the fun thing about cognition is that your brain doesn't work like that. Your brain needs the structure to attach things to. We don't teach people how to identify problems. We teach people what problems are. This is a problem. Here's how you solve it. Here's the problem. Here's how you solve it. So right now, specifically, let's take school and COVID. We have a, at least here in Northern Virginia, you and I, our kids, your kids and my kids are in different school systems, but both of them are doing the same thing. A huge amount of the admin, a huge amount of the staff, a huge amount of the resources is going into getting us back to normal. Back to normal does not exist. It will never happen. So instead of using those same resources in getting through it, getting to the new normal, getting to the solution to the problem, everyone's like, we have to get it back to neutral where we know how to fix this. That's not problem solving, that's regression. That is intentional. Let's throw all of our money into getting us back to the status quo where we know how to operate. Our educators don't know how to solve the problem. They don't even know how to identify the problem because I bet if you asked them all, they wouldn't tell you the problem was the same thing. Half of them would tell you, well, the problem is that our students aren't in the classroom. That's not the problem. <laughs> well, uh, there's two things you have going on here. Um, I think we can take this conversation broader OK, because I think that you are right that I don't know if it, like you said, I don't know if it's a human thing or an American thing. Yeah. We're not interested in teaching people how to solve problems. That's a bigger issue than uh, our education system is based on uh, 
the factory remodeled school. Uh, Frontier Living. Yeah. It, it's based on you need to learn enough in a school of 12 children before you go and be a farmer. And right. we have blown that up bigger, but yep. it haven't really changed the parameters. Right. And, and so you're right that going into COVID, it has become even clearer that that's absurd, but it's been 100 years coming. Sure. Um, so that's certainly valid. But yeah, I don't want to get the conversation sidetracked into that because I think that's no. just one manifestation no, I mean, yeah. of this. I will say really quick, like, yes, from a curriculum standpoint, I didn't learn how taxes worked. I didn't learn how society worked in a lot of ways. I didn't learn a lot of life skills that it was the responsibility of my progenitors to teach me. I did learn a lot about the periodic table that does not in any way affect me. Like, don't get me wrong, I needed to have some chemistry. Like, that's, yeah. I, I, I'm not saying we should stop teaching chemistry and physics, but I'm saying that way more was way more was taught to me, uh, forced into me about the the kings of England and the history of the Renaissance history and art history that, again, I like those things when life skills were left out. But that is not today. Today we're talking about specifically whether it's English, I mean, as an art form like literature, English or math or science, we are not taught generally how to identify and solve problems. We're taught how to follow a tutorialized set to solve problems that have already been identified by other people. Yeah, well, it's fun, of course, and easy to point at, like, well, we're here to solve problems and other people just don't get it. So I want to go down a story for our viewers of a place where you and I, and I know a lot of video producers are on the wrong side of that. Uh, we can't love this. We can't change. So uh, just to kind of briefly set this up for um, those of you who are not in media production business, uh, if you've heard of Photoshop, yeah. um, Photoshop is based around a dark room. You used to take a piece of film, expose it in a camera, put it in a little projector, take some paper, yeah. you know, and um, you'd use your hands or pieces of paper to dodge and burn. And, right. and all, all the stuff you did in the dark room, they put into Photoshop. Almost by name, and a it's, dodge it, burn. There's a dodge tool and a burn tool, and yeah. it looks like the little stick you used to hold. Yeah, so the, the little lollipop thing. And that, this is not my story at all, but I want to set up that a lot of digital media production emulates the old analog way of doing things. Right. Which brings us to uh, video editors, uh, the software. The video editor is a person who uses the video editing, which is software. The tool. Yeah. And the tool, uh, most of it is based around film editing. Right. You have your your strips and your timelines that look like like it's a you know uh, everything everything's laid out linearly and you have the yeah and splice you have the bins tool. which is also for a, film editing a bin and you have a, a razor blade as a splice tool like you're cutting yep. a piece of film and this is how most um, video editing machines were made was to emulate film editing a few of them emulated uh, videotape which is a little different sure. but it all came from real world stuff right and uh, I don't know ten maybe almost fifteen years ago. A lot of professionals used Apple's software, Final Cut Pro. Right. A few other people used Adobe's software, Adobe Premiere. They worked remarkably similar. Very similar, yeah. Apple, being who they are, got it in their heads to say, why are we emulating this old way of doing things, They're putting stuff in bins, and, and these are all limitations of film. We're doing everything digital now. Is, is they, they asked themselves, is thinking about replicating the old way of doing things limiting what we can do. I see where you're going because with Because if we're trying to replicate real world things, we can't do a thing that's not a real world thing. It like We just wouldn't have thought of it. So they completely redid Final Cut Pro. Came up with the magnetic timeline. And they came up with the magnetic timeline, which is not a real thing in the real world. You don't have uh, audio magnetically sticking to film and following it when you move it. And They came up with a lot of things that only made sense in a computer. Yeah. And guys like you and me, couldn't stand it. No, it absolutely haywired our brain. Tried. I tried to use it for a while, and and in fairness to us, they came out with the software without a lot of features. They they when they introduced it, it was kind of bare bones. But, you are really talking me into giving this another shot right now. But the they kept improving it, and they didn't charge any money for like the last ten years. If you bought it ten years ago, you still have it now, and they've kept updating it the whole time. And we we all switched to Premiere, which is like okay, that we know how this works. Premiere and old Final Cut are the same. New Final Cut, we can't deal with. Right. And no, I ask myself this every year, which is, am I not giving Final Cut an, another try in you know 2018 and 2019 and 2020? Am I not giving it a try because I'm an old fuddy duddy, or 
And this Probably. is this is what I want to tell myself is, oh, well, I, I am a special case. I'm doing things they didn't anticipate. I need the old way. I, I can't do the work I did. And in, in, this was true at first. The first year when I gave it a try, um, I used to do I, remember this. I used to it. do plays where I would run audio sources into different cameras. And the new Final Cut anticipated you doing cameras are recorded here. Audio is recorded on an audio device. That's how the software was built. I couldn't I couldn't. Uh, strip out from the multiple cameras. Now I could in like the film editing mode, but they had like a live switch mode. Right. In the live switch mode, I had to pick what's your audio source. One, you had to pick one. So if I had two mics here and two mics here, I had to pick one or the other. So that, that's where I got right. down on Final Cut Pro. Well, it's been ten years. You know what? I bet they fixed that by now. Yeah, they have. Um, and so this is a case where they went out of their way to do something in a completely brand new, let's burn everything to the ground way, and I couldn't follow them and and no i do keep asking myself should i give it another try and thus far the answer has been no <laughs> so interesting so there's a bunch of ways to respond to that first off amazing example so one i can co come it from the my fault i'm guilty too you're right i have given uh apple so much flack for like yeah you know what do you do when you have a 49 percent app uh, market share behind avid uh you burn it to the ground and, and and you give all of your market share to your your third place competitor adobe that's great guys where they failed was in telling literally no one what you just said. They're like, oh, by the way, we've changed everything. Have fun. Like, had they been Apple about it and said, join us in the future, had they said what you just said, we don't use bins anymore because you don't know what it, there's a there's a meme going around. I don't know if it's real or not it, of this guy with a 3.5 floppy disk. And this kid goes, oh, my gosh, did you 3D print the save symbol from your computer? It's like. <laughs> No, that's that, uh, yeah. the kids today don't know what that that thing is. They don't yeah. know that that was a real thing. Um, to your same point, it's it's all based on this, and we say this like hang up the phone. When's the last time you hung up a phone? <laughs> roll, you don't hang up a phone. Roll, anymore. roll down the window. You can't, roll down the window. You can't do that. Dial anymore. a phone number. I've almost never dialed a phone number since my grandmother had a dial phone. But in my entire life, it's been touch tone. That's not dial. Um, Truly, though, that comes into a point of communication is I think that they, especially with Apple, the people that are big on uh, 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 disruption, I think had they explained to literally anyone what they were doing, they'd have gotten a lot more people to follow them. They did. I think the two the two mistakes I think they did is Apple's always premature on stuff like okay. we, we have. I'm using this laptop right here that requires a million dongles because they reduced it to one port type when a lot of devices don't use that port type. And they do that on purpose to force the industry. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what they were doing with Final Cut, I think, is, is they're like, all right, this is gonna be the way everybody does it, let's just jump on early, right. and, but then nobody else followed. And they didn't, <laughs> because they didn't communicate it. They gave away their market. Steve Jobs had already stepped down by that point, and Tim Cook gave away their market share. Steve Jobs was yeah, a this genius. Was, this, was, this was like 15 years, this was like 12. 2011. Uh, Final Cut? Yep. Uh, really, I thought it was earlier than yep. that. Because I was still using Final Cut in LA. Yeah. I moved from LA in 2009, 2010. It happened right, it was 10 years ago almost exactly. Steve Jobs, if not had stepped down, he was damn close. This was a Tim Cook decision. I'm willing to bet you. I could be wrong. Internet trolls, come at me. So real quick, uh, Kelt Misses came in and said, this is a huge issue uh, that, that we aren't teaching life skills. We're not teaching, you know, we're teaching these high-minded things, you know, I know more about Shakespeare. Don't get me wrong, I love Shakespeare. I've performed Shakespeare, I've performed at the Folgers Theater. I love Shakespeare. I can right now quote you some of my favorite passages, but I still don't know how to do taxes. And I spent years <laughs> being taught about a 500-year-old a dead poet that may or may not have even written the stuff but I was given very little in modern societal life skills. Yeah, my point of that story was not to say that this stuff is impossible, but uh, this is more of an example of we're resistant to it. Right, so, so let me give you the example that I love about uh, teaching impressionism. So let's take math and science out of this and apply it to art, because art is, is my favorite. Uh, because I just I just made a joke about teaching Shakespeare, um, uh, you know, uh, teaching Shakespeare and teaching you know these old systems and things like that. So one day you walk into art class. You could be in eighth grade. You could be in twelfth grade. You could be in a college class. And right now you walk in and there's a on the projector up uh, on the board uh, is a picture of Vincent Van Gogh. And you walk up and 
Uh, I know many people that very similar thing to this exact thing happened. And whether it's a 20 minute lecture or a four hour lecture or a two week lecture, the teacher then explains who Vincent Van Gogh was, how he was poor and a manic depressive, how he died never having been truly appreciated. Uh, here are the kinds of brushes he used. Here are the kind of canvases he used. Here's the kind of strokes he used. And your next assignment is to do a piece in the style of Vincent Van Gogh. You will be graded based on X, Y, Z. Here is the rubric. Here is the st stylus, a syllabus. Here is the this. Go ahead. And an hour later, a week later, at, at the end of that assignment, you'll walk up and you'll hand them your thing. You're like, oh, well, see, based on the rubric, these brush strokes are too long. The pressure's not right. And you have failed. Everything about what I just said is stupid. And it's not, I didn't make it up. That's a real story. We're judging this artistic style. Where, well, no, Vincent Van Gogh wasn't trying to come up with his own style, with his own, he was trying to be impressionist. Now, what if instead of what I just said, what if when you came in, you said, Today, class, we're going to be talking about Impressionism. Fo uh, before Impressionism, people were trying to make paintings that were as true to life as possible, and they got okay at it. And then the Impressionists came on and said, what if we made pictures that weren't things, but just looked like it? So you're going to do Impressionists. Here's an Impressionist, water lilies, here's an Impressionist, Van Gogh, here's an Impressionist, here's an Impressionist. I'm now going to take these off so you can't use them as reference points. Go. And so then someone comes over and they take, here are your tools, and they do a finger painting of a horse and it looks awful. And you're like, okay, does that look like a horse? No. Why not? Well, it doesn't have it. And you walk them through the processes of the problems. You help them identify the problems of Impressionism. You help them identify the solutions to overcoming those problems. You help them figure it out. You don't teach them how Van Gogh did it or how Monet, Monet did it or Manet. Or, you don't teach them how it's been done. You let them find the problem. Does that splotch look like a horse to you? Well, no. Why? Well, it has no detail. What can you do that gives it detail? No, you just drew an eye. What can you do impressionistically? Well, what if I did dots? What if I did dashes? What if I did scratches? What if I did... You let them identify the problems. You let them identify potential solutions without violating the purpose. And then you let them overcome them. Now you've allowed them to develop the architecture in their brain for problems, for identifying problems. You've allowed them to identify the problem possible solutions and execute. And as they failed along the way, that was good. You, you just learned a new way to not solve this problem. Instead, we show them an end result and grade them on their ability to match that end result, which is cognitively and creatively defeatist. I was in my master's program before someone handed me a situation and said, what is the problem? <laughs> not here hey, is the problem. Here is the problem. Solve this. I was in my master's degree. And finally, my teacher came to me, handed me a paper and said, Kirk. Well, she said to the whole class, she wasn't just talking to me. Kirk and the rest. Kirk and everybody else. What is the problem here? And the most beautiful thing was we all had to write a paper on it. One page, like in class, like that day, right then. And what was beautiful, I mean, this particular class was ethics for the record. Uh, and there were 12 of us. And all 12 people identified a different problem. Hmm. Nobody, and, and, and people were like, well, what about this? And I was like, I have no problem with that. And they're like, you don't think it's unethical? I was like, not if they didn't get caught. Like, <laughs> it's like the, um, the thing, it sounds like an urban legend, but I'm told it's true, is the, um, the uh, college student who came late to class. And, and the, threw his paper in? Oh, no, no, the, oh. um, the, um, the professor had written on the board at the beginning of class he said like here's three problems that have like never been solved they've they've mathematicians have been working on them for years and then like a minute later this kid walks in and they finish the class and he sees them on the board writes them down thinking their homework and goes home and solves them <laughs> because he wasn't told these are problems that people have been struggling with for years he just thought it was the homework i want that to be true no it, i think it is like, like there's like a million like urban legend joke versions of it but like if you if you google this it like it did there's, there's some mathematical theorem where like that's how it got solved it was like it was like in the 60s or 70s some college student solved it because nobody told him it was too hard to do no and i i absolutely love this stuff and truly i nearly failed out of every math class i've ever taken because someone came to me and said okay here is how you do for and, and i'll tell you to this very moment this is why i don't get math is they'll say here's how you do fractions first you add the diagonals and then you multiply and there and i go okay why why do we do that and they're like because that's how you solve it okay <laughs> i always said and i said something about my brain uh I don't think I'm being 
hyperbolic here. Hyperbolic. Hyperbolic here is that the more I studied in math, the worse I did like across high school and so college. So it just worked for you. Like, like if I just sat and was like, okay, do A, insert slot A into slot B, you show me what to do, recreate. Like I could get a C, I could pass. I was never good at it, but I could do it. The more I tried to understand, well, why does this work? The worse my grade would get because I started like flying off the rails. No, and, and my point is that I asked so many questions is like, but so why does this work? They're like, don't worry about the why, just put it in the equation. And But the problem is in my brain, the way my brain works is they had never attached any logic to it. They had never attached any, any solid, all they'd given me was a tutorialized set, told me not to answer, ask questions. It's like, but, and the few times that I finally started getting a hold of things, like, oh, I can solve this problem by doing the Kirk method. <laughs> and I, I'm dead serious, by the way, uh, in algebra, solving for X and stuff like that. I figured out the Kirk method. And I started getting the correct answer 70, 80% of the time. Mm. And I would get them all wrong because like, you didn't show your work. Or you did it right, but that's not how you, you solved this. You didn't show the or work you, we showed you. You showed yeah. your work, but that's not how you do this, so you got it wrong. And I'm like, so now we're penalizing. And this isn't a straw man argument. This happened to me. I was given wrong, I was given bad grades for correct answers because I did not get the answer the way they told me to. We are not being told to solve problems. We are to being told to master processes that have been established by other people. And I'm not trying to get all conspiracy theory, damn the man, it's just, that's not what I'm doing here. Well, it's, uh, I guess that's where podcasts take us, because I was gonna say that's what uh, George Carlin always said, is that schools are there to create factory workers, not to create intellectuals. Right, absolutely. <laughs> it's, really, George Carlin, that's a George Carlin I, that's, thing? That's not a quote, that's a, summation of a 10 minute rant. Because I know that's, that's, a, that's almost directly a Seth Godin thing, is that he talks yeah. about like, we, you know, the, the coal company came in and said, we'll give you a school, and the, the coal company wanted your kids to grow up to be coal miners. So they taught you follow in line, do, you know, color inside the lines, follow the rules, be a good this, and you were given, you were given points for your submission, and you were given demerits for your non, uh, or your nonconformity. And it didn't matter if you got it right or wrong. It wasn't about being right or wrong. It was about being a conformist or a nonconformist. And again, I'm super duper not trying to be like, damn the man, let's burn schools to the ground. <laughs> I'm just saying that when did we stop teaching people to, and forget solving the problem. We don't even teach people how to identify the problem. We tell them what the problem is and then teach them the tutorial on how to solve it. So the question then becomes, you're a parent, I'm a parent, in that, well, let's reinvent, reinvent the school system. It's not really an option. <laughs> that, I mean, for us. Right. How do we, or you know, you're know, you a project manager at your company and you have a bunch of, and you have Ivy League students and you have community college students and you have high school dropouts, you have all these people. But the thing you know is that from the Ivy League valedictorian all the way down to the high school dropout, you know one thing to be true. None of them has been taught how to solve problems. Yeah. They've been taught at different levels how to follow processes identified by somebody else. So how do we as managers, intellectuals, parents, how do we start to put in problem identification and problem solving into our own tutorial, not our own curriculum? That's, uh, I mean, I think people in our industry deal with that problem because we've all come out of the same education system, but we work in a creative field sure. where creativity is actually lauded a little bit. It's yeah. actually part of the job. Right. Like a lot of jobs, creativity is like, oh, this can make the job more fun or, or right. <laughs> but in our job, it's like, it's a pretty key component. Right. And um, which is why I work here. I remember um, I've, I've, I know you love this story. Um, the first boss I had out of college uh, was trying to impart, you know, we, he, he was more experienced and he had younger employees. Yeah. And sure. um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he was trying to impart. Um, he meant it more as a chain of command kind of a lecture, but it gets back to the point of being creative in your problem solving. Sure. Um, he, we, we, oh, we were that story. I was like, yeah. Where is this going? Yeah, we, uh, we were video producers and we, we made videos. And his point was, hey, I'm directing this video and there's a lot going on. I don't have time to deal with all the details. That, that's what he was trying to impart. Right. But uh, I think you and I both took a lot more out of this story. I tell this story every set I work which on. He, he, said, um, he said, look, if I say I need a chocolate cake to be in this scene and you go to the store, I send you to the store to get a chocolate cake and they don't have any chocolate cakes. I do not want you to call me on the phone and tell me they don't have cakes. I do not want you to come back 
without a cake. He says, I want you to go buy a hat box, get some chocolate frosting and put the frosting on the cake and put it on set. He says, because then I have my cake on camera. He says, I don't care that it's not a cake. He's like, you skipped a part. Oh, what part did I skip? You said, you, you have two options. This is how you've always told us, you yeah, have two yeah. options. You can either go get a hat box and cover it in chocolate frosting, or bring me a vanilla cake and tell me how that's what I actually wanted all along. Yeah, so multiple options, the point always being, don't come back without a cake. Don't come back with another problem. That, that's the core message yeah. is come back with a solution, not a problem. And he was focusing on the come back with a solution part. But what he was also teaching us was the there can be many solutions. Sure. And that's that's the part that you said with math, too, is that yeah. that's the part we don't. Uh, encourage people is that once you've found an answer, we call that the answer. And there really can be multiple answers. So I want to cover both of these. First off, uh, Kelt Mrs. said that, yes, her son has all or I, I assume it was a woman uh, that the, uh, that her son also uh, has had that happen, getting the right answer wrong for good. Yeah. Right. And then uh, a user came in and said reinvention is also an option. Now, first off, user. So for those who are watching, we're doing live on TikTok. If you're watching on YouTube, this is obviously pre-recorded. But if you'd like to watch these on TikTok, we do them live on TikTok as well. If you want to comment and be a part of the interaction. Um, Reinvention is an option, and actually, I am a big proponent. Jeff has heard me; I've literally given a keynote speech of this at the project managers conference uh, at a project managers conference that reinventing the wheel is the greatest thing ever. And anyone who says don't reinvent the wheel is an idiot. But he just came in with another comment, or she. Uh, you have to have the info of the end goal, sort of, sort of. Not if there. Yes, if there is. A, a, an end state that is required, you do have to have that information. That's the single piece of information you have to have. But the way that I like to tell people this, and we've uh, Jeff has heard me say this to a million clients as well, uh, and some of them don't take kindly to it. I don't care. Uh, there are two things you're allowed to give your your employees. There's two things you're allowed to accept from your clients. Two. That's it. Two things. One, a deadline and a deliverable. They can say, I need this tomorrow, and I need it to be these parameters. I need this painting on my desk by tomorrow. That's the deadline. That's the deliverable. You can't tell me the paintbrush I have to use in the canvas unless the canvas is part of the deliverable. You can't give me parameters that don't. You can give me a deadline and a deliverable. What drives me crazy is people like to, and everyone has to wear green the whole time. Because <laughs> now we're giving people a tutorialized set that has nothing to do with the solution. Um, but I love that Joe story where, because, yeah, go to the grocery. Uh, we used to have someone that worked here, and I'd send them to do something, and they would call me, like, all the time. They're like, hey, I'm at the store. What do you think? And they'd send me a picture, this one or this one. I was like. That's what I sent you to do. <laughs> I, I literally sent. I didn't send you to save my car mileage. I sent you to go handle this. And they were set. They, they worked in uh, design and stuff like that. So I'd send them, like, hey, we need a sweater and some shoes for this music video. And they'd go, and they'd be like, which sweater do you like more, this one or this one? I was like, I like the fact that you're going to come back with a sweater, and I didn't have to think about it. That was my favorite part. <laughs> my favorite part was this not being my problem anymore. Um, I am averse to choices in general, though. Like The, the human brain is, but none of us understand that. <laughs> I, I would... Uh, so uh, we used to have someone here that worked work named Corey, and every once in a while she'd like go grab lunch. And she's like, hey, what do you want for lunch? And I was like, oh, food. She's like, no, just like, what? I'm like, I truly don't care. Like, just just bring food. I will eat food. I have no restrictions, no limitations, no allergies, just food. She's like, would you rather have a stop? I want food. Like, I just, I, I don't want to think about it. That's what I want. I want to not have this problem. If you take um, Kirk to the um, oh, this is fun. fast casual restaurants, you know, all your your Chipotle's, your mod pizzas, your, you know, the, the, the places where you point at a dozen choices in a row. Um, I will order what I want to eat. And Kirk, Kirk, Kirk will look at the employees and say, which one of you has been here the longest? And whoever raises their hand, he's like, make me something. Yeah. My favorite one is this. Uh, we have a pizza place across the street called Mod Pizza. And I'll walk And The first time I walked in, I went in, I was like. Who here would you say, and I said a little bit louder, like, who here would you say is the pizza artist? And like three people all pointed at one. I was like, hey, you're making my pizza. And he's like, I'm not on pizza. It's like, there are no rules. I do pineapple, I do sweet, I do salty, I do everything. There are any, there's no rules. Make me the pizza that you make yourself on break. He's like, oh, you won't like that. I'm like, Let's prove it. Prove it. <laughs> I don't do choices. You solve the problem. Make me the best pizza that is possible with these ingredients. Because even these workers, every once in a while, I will see their brain go haywire. They're like, but do you like anything? But do you, just solve it. But do, 
make a pizza. Your pizza. The best pizza. That, but I don't know what you like. I've taken that off the table. That's not a concern. The concern is make a pizza. Um, which is to, uh, to the user's point of make a pizza. That's the end state. Make something that I can eat. But people are so, these workers, you know, every job you've ever had, the first day HR gave you a guidebook of how, what the expectations were. Expectations are good. I'm fine with there being corporate expectations. Not that they haven't gotten me fired a few times, but still. Um, expectations are fine. But Steve Jobs once said, you know, don't hire smart people and tell them what to do. Hire smart people and have them tell you what to do. And other than Steve Jobs, I've never had a manager. Well, he's never been my manager, so that was weirdly phrased. But I've never had a manager do that. I've had a manager hire me and then tell me how I was going to, what part of their job I was going to do for them. Never what my job to accomplish was. Never what my problem to solve was. They said, here is the problem I have. Here is how it is going to be solved and you are going to work 40 hours a week to fix it. And then I would say some variation of want to bet and... Yeah, there's the uh, the old saying that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> I don't know if that's attributed to a particular person. So user, uh, it's not that I don't want to make decisions. It's that I don't want to make a decision. I, I recognize when I am not the best person to answer it. I... I'm not a chef. If I go to a place that, that has a hundred options to go on the pizza, I know that there is someone else in that room better qualified to tell me what is going to taste good. And I find the person there that has been the longest and I don't want to occupy my brain or my time with decisions that I know for a fact I am not the best. There are other times that Jeff has seen this as well, that I will, I know for a fact that I am the person with the best answer and that the other answers in the room aren't the one that's going to solve the problem or is misidentifying the problem. But if someone's saying, what do you want on your pizza? I'm not the person in the room with that information. Also another point to your user there is there's two, really I see it, two, two reasons to hire another human being. Right. One for just muscle. I need you to pick boxes off the floor and put them in the truck. Absolutely. Load the truck, unload the truck. Um, or you, you you want the contributions of their brain power. Huma right. Humanity has never accomplished anything worthwhile without bringing a bunch of people together. Correct. Even even the, the even Michelangelo sculpting by himself, he needs the quarrymen to get the rock out of the ground. Right. Everything's a chain. Right. And Michelangelo, it, as far as I know, did not dig, dig the marble out of the rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it all it all comes together. And so uh, if so the person says, oh, you don't want to make choices, the the problem there is the more choices you make, the less you are taking advantage of all this extra brain power in sure. the room. It's like having a, a multi-core computer and only using one core. Right. Like you've wasted a lot of money on a right. computer that you're not using, or you've wasted a lot of money on some very smart people to never listen to them. Right. Uh, and that, that's what making your own decisions is, is not listening to them. And there are absolutely times you need to do that. D definitely. But if you're finding that's what you're always doing, sure. then you have missed something. No. And I mean, and to the, to the lunch, the, I mean, the lunch conversation is the best one. There would, there have honestly been times, mostly when I was working for the government, but absolutely here a few times as well. When work has come to a dead stop for anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour while everyone is figuring out what we should order for lunch. <laughs> They're like, oh, hey, the uh, the lunch order's up on the computer in Jeff's office. Go uh, figure out what you want. I want food. No, just go put your order in the computer in Jeff's office. <laughs> just double whatever someone else said. I will eat that. Because I, I've watched so many people, they are like, oh, go bring your brain and your attention span, ADD by the way, bring your brain, your attention span and your, your resources and your core, your core processing power. Stop it right now to go decide between a hundred options, all of which you'd like. You'd be fine with any of them. And that seems to me to be just bring back food. I'm done. Yeah, and this is all situational. Like uh, if I'm going, if I'm just gonna go get lunch, I'm going to be very particular about where I go and what I order. But if we're on a video shoot, I've, I've done this where I'm on oh, a yeah. shoot with a client and the client comes up and says, I got a menu from the deli. What does everybody want? This, Club this, sandwich. This, Every time. Yeah. No, this is what happened uh, three weeks ago. I was on a job and the client came in that we were setting up in a conference room and we had a, bunch, a couple of crew people there. She's like, everybody come write down your order. And I said, "What? where is this menu from? I didn't even want to look at it. So where is it from? She says, well, it's the deli in the basement of the office building. I said, am I correct that they have something on that menu that looks something like a club sandwich? And she said, yeah. And I said, 
that's what I want. Thank you. And I went, went back to work. <laughs> so yeah, Kelp misses. I, I, uh, I'm the same. I, the best pizzas I've ever had, the best food I've ever had is when I walk into a, a restaurant and I, I tell them to give me what I, I want. If the chef says you really should try this or that, the most hipster thing I've ever done, however, was I ordered off the menu once <laughs> at a gastro pub in Alexandria. It was Old Town Alexandria. It's a little hipster street, like 1800s, 1700s street in Northern Virginia near where we live. And uh, the waiter came over and I and she said, the chef really recommends the tomato bisque. It's excellent. And he has a fresh batch of the tomato bisque today. And I'm looking at the menu and I was like, see, I have a problem. She's like, what's that? I was like, I really want the tomato bisque, but I do not see a grilled cheese sandwich on your menu. <laughs> and she said, hold on one second. And she left. And she came back and she was like, the chef said he would love to make you a grilled cheese sandwich to go with his tomato bisque. I was like, well, then I'll be having that. <laughs> but that's a little bit of an odd choice, uh, a story from me, but it's, there's always, when there is someone better qualified or with more uh, bandwidth to handle the problem, why on earth would you, here, let me drop all of my responsibilities and go sit at Jeff's computer to add my order to what we're getting from Jimmy John's. Get me a sandwich. I'll be fine with that um, because there's always someone there, there's except for when there's not there's there are people that are more qualified to solve that problem and when there isn't that's what you're getting paid for hey I'm the person to solve this problem this is the problem that I'm here to solve and no one else can solve this better than me that's why I'm here or maybe they might be better at it, but this is the job that I was hired to solve. So this is the job job that I'm, uh, this is my lane. Yeah, that's the key part is identifying those times because they, they're, they're right. If you push everything off, then you're useless. <laughs> yeah. But you got to identify the times when, when it's your show. I, I Agreed. I don't know what wow so extra means. It might just mean referring to me being super hyper or... Uh, or the fact that I ordered off the menu. I don't know when the agamet popped up. But. Yeah, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it probably <coughs> went to the uh, tomato soup story. The tomato guess, soup story. Yeah. So, back to the core concept of of this particular episode, and that's identifying problems and solving them. It's it's largely when we you know you were there. I spoke at the uh, the project manager conference last year, or no, I guess it was this year. It was, it was around January. I do not remember which side of January it fell on. I'm pretty sure it was like January, February, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure it was this year, but early this year, I spoke at a project manager conference, and these are people, you know, they are all P, uh, PMPs, project man management professionals. They have been managing projects of every size and shape for hundreds of years, like, hey, I've been doing this forever. And the problem with doing the same thing over and over is you get the false sense of reality where you think you know anything that can happen. No, you know everything that has happened. <laughs> you know everything that does happen. And you know the ways that you have found that are the best. But what you don't know are all the options and other ways that you could be more efficient. Because what we do is we get so set in this tutorial as are you waterfall or agile? You know what that means? What they're asking you are, which tutorialized set are you following? This tutorialized set that you were given or this one, Waterfall or Agile? Why not? Are you a scrum master? I'm a scrum master. You know what that means? That means that I passed someone else's test for being able to follow their tutorialized set. I'm it's not saying that there's nothing to be said for yeah, certifications. I say, I say it's it's important to identify the world, where it, not not the overall world, our industry, look at that word. Sure. The, this may vary from industry to industry. Every, everything you just said will serve you perhaps poorly in a creative endeavor. Sure. But straying from those principles are the two times we had space shuttles blow up. So <laughs> there's there's something to be said whoa, for a whoa, checklist. Whoa, whoa. Like, I'm not, and again, I never said the checklists are bad. You can make a deliverable and a deadline as strict as you want. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just I'm just pointing out that like you and I both argue passionately for things and most everything we argue passionately for, the, the key in life is to figure out where to apply it and where sure. to apply something else. And that that's the tricky part. No, and I mean, if if I work for NASA and someone gives me a launch sequence and says, it's very important that it goes in this order. I got you, man. Not the time to wax creative. But what if I hit launch before ignition? Like, no, no. First off, that probably won't work. And if you hit ignition too soon, that might blow up. Like, there's obviously, don't misunderstand, there's always times that, that creativity, 
there's never a case that creativity isn't isn't good. Never. Creativity is good in all things. But creativity can be misapplied because there are times that what you're thinking of would be a creative approach isn't it's detrimental. It's not creative. And uh, if I could tell you a story about your own life, um, what is always interesting is to a lot of us think of creativity creativity in too specific a way. Sure. Um, Agreed. For those who don't know, Kirk had a rather prestigious role on High School Musical 2, the Disney wow. Channel uh, Spectacular, where... See, Kirk, it's not name dropping if he does it for me. Kirk, Kirk, yeah. Kirk's job was... Zach Efron and I. <laughs> Kirk's job was what's called Video Village. Yeah. And what, what that means is if you're a movie director, you're shooting stuff and, and you got a bunch of cameras going and you're watching the actors, you're like, action, and then you're like, that was amazing. But you couldn't see everything. And right. and now now you're like, well, what happened? You go over to Kirk and Kirk's got a bunch of monitors and he's been recording everything. And, and the director might say, I want to see that flip again. And he's like, OK, OK, it's it's instant replay. It's instant replay for movie making. Right. And from each camera, because because often we were shooting on. Yeah, you we never only shot on one. We shot on two to four. You only have one set of eyes. So right. like if the director wants to then come over and re watch stuff, that was Kirk's job. And when people think, oh, creativity is like the actors and the directors. And if, if Kirk had come in and, and said to uh, with Ortega, Kenny Ortega, Kenny Ortega had, had Kirk had come in and be like, I think they should be jumping left instead of right. Like he would have been fired very quickly, <laughs> like, especially if you know anything about Kenny Ortega. That would not have gone my way. That's that's not the kind of creativity he was there for. But when he comes over and wants to watch it, it needs to work. And so if it was like, well, I need to be here so that he can see it and I'm not in the way of the camera, but the power now can't run through the set. Like there's a lot of creativity. It Lots sounds of like it sounds like logistics, but logistics is creativity. Oh, logistics is. So there's I'm a, a logistics officer in the, uh, the Army Reserve, and that's like what I do. There's a ton of creativity in logistics. Yeah. And so it's, it's a very interesting thing to say that. Kirk had a very creative problem solving role on a movie set. He, sure. he, he had to be day to day basis, extremely creative. Despite the fact that I was not on the creative team. But, but had he tried to say something to the creative team, he would have been fired. Like you're not creative in that way, but you're creative in a very different yet very important way. And uh, yeah, no, I had to, I had to apply the rules of creativity on set every single day. Despite the fact that my creativity is in no way seen on camera at any point, I was not part of the creative nor the writing process. I was not a creative member of set other than then my job required some pretty creative uh, problem solving a lot. Yeah, if you had just... Especially if you know anything about working with Kenny Ortega, Google this. <laughs> you had just followed the rules and be like, why is the monitor over here? Oh, well, the court didn't reach. And you didn't solve that problem? Yeah, you know, like, that's no. a problem that needs solving. <laughs> yeah. No, my favorite, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but, uh, well, sort of. So Kenny Ortega is a screamer, uh, unless you ask him, because then he claims that he's the nicest guy ever, but he <laughs> likes to yell, like, a lot. Um, especially at crew, not at cast. He's a sweetheart teddy bear to cast members, but to crew, he <laughs> screams a lot. Um, and I sat literally next to him. I was I was in the cone of fury because I was, he sat at Video Village most of the time. So when he wanted to scream, I was the cat uh, with his tail under the rocking chair. I was <laughs> right there 100% uh, of the time. For the first few days of set, however, there was me and another guy were sharing the role. His name was Mike. My name was Kirk, just so we're clear on who people were. Uh, Mike left set after the first week. There was no Mike. Kenny continued to call me Mike <laughs> for weeks. <laughs> weeks. And so one day he's screaming at me. I didn't do it. And he's screaming at me and he's like, Mike, son of a bitch. Mike, son of a and finally, the second AD, who was just bemused at this point, goes, um, Kenny, his name is Kirk. <laughs> and and Kenny's face goes stark white. <laughs> stark white and goes, what? He's like, him? His name's Kirk. He goes, I've been calling you Mike since week one. I was like, yes, sir, you have. He's <laughs> like, why wouldn't you correct me? I was like, Kenny, because the only time you ever said my name didn't seem like you were in a mood to be corrected. <laughs> He's like, you don't let someone call you the wrong name. I was like, had you ever been saying my name nicely, I would have taken that <laughs> opportunity. But the only time you were saying my name, I felt it was good for you to be screaming somebody else's. <laughs> and then he laughed at that. To which Rob goes, the second AD's name was Rob, goes, don't worry about it, Kirk. He's been calling me Rob since before we started shooting. <laughs> and Kenny goes, holy, what's your name? And he goes, oh no, it's Rob. <laughs> it was it was the best uh, 
Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Kelp Misses. So for those of you who, again, who are watching on YouTube, we go live. I am Kirk the Creative. We also release the creative on uh, on TikTok. If you want to be part of the conversation, we have it live on uh, TikTok over here. But hey, thank you. Uh, check us out on YouTube. But um, yeah, it was a it was one of those moments that at the end of it, the UPM came up to me and and uh, and she said, "I don't think we could have had a better person for your role." And I was like. I coiled cable, Sharon. <laughs> like, that was my job. I coiled cable. And she's like, no. She's like, your job was to be in the eye of the hurricane. And not let it affect you. <laughs> and deal with it. And she's like, you didn't lose your temple temper. Huh? You didn't lose your temper. You didn't even seem to let it affect your job performance. You got yelled at more than anyone for things that had nothing to do with your job. <laughs> And you kept a cool head, you solved problems, you were here early, you stayed late. It's like, I don't think we could have had anyone deal with him the way you did. And I'm like, eh. Like, and it's, that's not really a creativity thing, but it's, it is that problem solving. Was yelling at him or firing back or brussling or this isn't my job, man. Was that gonna solve the problem? Nope. Was it gonna create new ones? Yep. <laughs> so when your job is to t be the cat he kicks, Take it, and and again, I got recognized for that. They asked me back for a couple more movies. It was a, it ended up being a pretty good gig. Other and I mean, like I said, I got to hang out with Vanessa Hudgens and Zac Efron before they were Z Vanessa Hudgens and Zac Efron. Uh, if you friend me on Facebook, you can see me pic uh, pictures of us all hanging out. Um, if you can find me on Facebook, but yeah. Anyway, um, problem solving. Sometimes it's your job to be the pro to solve the problem. Sometimes it's your job to stay out of the way of the problem. But the problem we have the biggest is that we are not teaching our employees, our 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 team members, our teammates, or our clients even how to identify problems. So I, I guess my my word of wisdom for today would would simply be when you know exactly what the problem is, stop and ask yourself, is it the problem? My favorite tool for figuring this out is the five whys. And this will be how I just kind of end my portion is, I don't remember his name, uh, it's Japanese and I apologize, but I, I don't remember his name, but he employed something called the five whys. And anytime you find a problem, ask yourself why and ask yourself why five times. You ask a nurse and she says, oh my gosh, this hospital is, this hospital is running itself into the ground. Really? Why? Oh, well, you know, we all work 80 hour weeks, overtime half the time to, really? Why? Oh, because the scheduling system is super old. It hasn't been, really? Why? And if you do that five times, you will end up figuring out what the problem actually is. Because so much of what we do is either tutorialized sets, which I've said a lot of times, or it's symptom chasing. It's like back to the thing that I opened the show with, oh, the biggest problem we have in our school systems right now is that the kids aren't in the classroom. That's not true. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem we're having right now is that under current conditions, we are having a harder time getting the information to the kids. Why? Because they're not in the classroom. Why? Because of COVID. Why? Because of blah, blah, blah. So, but now we can solve it with what tools do we have to solve the actual problem? The, the education of the kids, the, the current, Right now, we're not gonna get our kids back 100% in his classrooms. It wouldn't be responsible to do so. So instead of working on, working on a problem that isn't the problem, the problem at hand is education, which you can, is, is retention, is, is that one-on-one -on -one contact that we're not getting. Solving that is at our disposal. Solving the classroom issue isn't. So let's stop chasing the symptoms and stop chasing the tutorialized set and find the root cause by asking why like an insane two-year-old. You know what happens when you ask why five times and get to the core of the problem? What's that? It's Kevin Bacon. <laughs> that's six times, but yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's, uh, that's, I think that's the words of wisdom for today. Sounds good to me. All right, we'll be back next week. Thank you for joining us here on Release the Creative. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah, well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult?